All right, three, two, part one today. Polynomial functions. All right, so did you guys start math Excel for three one? Yeah. How does how is that going? <laughs> okay, so far. Good. All right, so last section three one was quadratic functions where we have a power of two. A couple chapters ago, we did linear functions where you have a power of one, and now we're going to get into bigger powers, um, third degree, fourth degree, fifth degree, um, which in general we call all of these polynomial functions. So we're going to start today with the definition of a polynomial. This is the formal definition at the top. I'm going to give you an example of one that we can use for a couple of these other little terms that are going to go along with it. So it says a polynomial function of degree n is a function of the following form, where n um, is a non-negative integer and the coefficients are all real numbers. So what a polynomial looks like is going to be something like this. It might be f of x equals negative 4x to the 6th plus 3x to the 4th minus 2x to the 3rd plus 4x minus 7, something like that, where we've got a number times our variable to a power, plus or minus, a number times a variable to a power, so on and so forth. Notice that the exponents are in descending order, kind of like when we write our quadratics, the exponents are highest to lowest. The highest exponent um, is your degree. So we would say my polynomial that I've written there is degree 6. And your exponents, your n's, must all be non-negative integers. So that means our whole numbers, um, 0 and everything about that. 0, 1, 2, 3, all of our counting numbers. Also, your coefficients, the numbers in front, need to be real numbers. So we've got some conditions here that make something a polynomial. Okay, but really just think of this as our linear equations, our quadratic equations just extended. The leading term is the first term when your terms are written in descending order. So in my example, the leading term would be negative 4x to the 6. The leading coefficient is the number in front of the first term. So in my example, that would be negative 4. The constant term, if your polynomial has one, is the number without a variable. So in my example, that would be negative 7. So degree, leading term, leading coefficient, constant, these are things that you might be asked to find um, if you are looking at a polynomial or if you are determining whether or not something is a polynomial. So special cases of polynomials, we said linear, degree 1, uh, quadratic, degree 2. We also have the constant function, which was one of our parent functions, f of x or y equals a number. The constant function is degree 0. So if you have y equals a number, we say the degree is 0 because that number we could attach an x to the 0 power at the end of it, and we know that anything to the 0 power is equal to 1, so that doesn't change our equation at all. The only exception to that is the zero function. y equals zero is the only polynomial that we say has no degree. All right, so in order we've got constant function degree zero, linear function degree one, quadratic degree two. After that we've got some other special names at the bottom there. We've got our cubic function that's degree three. That was another one of our parent functions. Quartic is degree 4. A quintic function is a degree 5 polynomial. And then after that, we just say degree 6, degree 7, degree 8, so on and so forth.
Oh, go ahead. You're fine. Everybody have what they need here? All good? Okay. A um, couple other properties of polynomials. First of all, the domain of a polynomial is all real numbers. If you look at that form of our basic equation, you are not going to have any denominators that would give you domain restrictions. You're not going to have any square roots, any radicals that would give you domain restrictions. So domain is always all real numbers. Also, the graph is a continuous smooth curve. So continuous means it doesn't look like a piecewise function. We don't have any breaks in the graph. So it's going to go forever from left to right without any breaks. Um, you can trace the whole thing without picking up your pencil. Also, it's a smooth curve, which means we have hills and valleys like we've seen before with our mins and maxes. We don't have any sharp corners. So an example of a graph that you guys know that has a sharp corner is the absolute value graph. The absolute value graph makes a V. That's a sharp corner because it has that sharp corner. Um, that's an easy way to tell that it is not a polynomial. Okay, so domain is all reals. The graph is a continuous, smooth curve. No sharp corners. No breaks in the graph. Okay, so let's kind of talk through a couple problems together first, and then you'll have an opportunity to practice on your big idea worksheet. So I've got some functions here. I want to know, first of all, yes or no, if they're a polynomial. If not, what part of the equation makes it not a polynomial? And then if it is, we're going to name those terms. Leading term, leading coefficient, all that stuff. So uh, first one, f of x equals x to the third minus 1 over x minus 1. What do you think? Yes or no? Is that a polynomial? It is not. What in this equation looks different than our form that we were given? It's got a denominator. It also has a domain restriction, right? That's an easy way to tell that will kind of carry over a lot of the different rules. X cannot be 1 in this example. If there's a domain restriction, domain is not all real numbers, not a polynomial. What about the second one? What do you think, yes or no? Why not? Again, domain restriction. X can only be greater than or equal to zero if you have a square root, so not a polynomial. What about the third one? Polynomial or no? Mm -hmm. Because? Yep, part of the definition said our exponents need to be non-negative integers, not a negative integer. Um, and no fractions, no decimals. Also, guys, remember negative exponents. You can make positive if you put that term in the denominator. So another way to rewrite that first term is 3 over x squared, which then you can see there's a domain restriction if you look at it that way. So either way, no. What about the fourth one? Domains all real numbers. I don't have anything weird with my exponents. I don't have any denominators. This is a polynomial. I'm going to put this in standard form, which means I'm just going to reorder my terms, exponents highest to lowest. Highest exponent is the fourth power, so my first term is going to be negative 7x to the fourth. Next, I have an x to the first with my negative 5x, and then positive 3, no variable at the end. What is the degree of this polynomial? Four. Degree is 4. What is the leading term of this polynomial? Negative. Close. That's your uh, leading coefficient is negative 7. Not quite. It's the whole thing. Negative 7x to the 4th. That whole term. And then the other thing, it doesn't say it up there, but the constant, sometimes you'll have one, sometimes you won't. If you have a constant, it's the number that doesn't have a variable. What's our constant? Three. Okay, on to your big idea worksheet. I want you guys to try the first three that are on there. Save part D, we'll do that one together. Try the first three. I want to know yes or no if it's a polynomial. If it is, name all the properties. If not, say why not. Thank you. 
All right. Did you get yes for part A? Degree is 5. They're not in order, but you could have reordered them if you want. Degree is 5. Leading term, negative 2x to the 5th. Leading coefficient, negative 2. Constant, negative 4. All good on that one? Part B is a no. Uh, for either of those reasons would make the whole thing not a polynomial, but you've got a variable in denominator, so domain restriction of 0. You have a square root, so you can't have negatives in your domain. Um, a square root, by the way, is also a fraction exponent. Square root of x is the one-half power, if you guys remember that from Algebra 2. So, again, that's not an integer exponent, so it would be another issue with our definition there. Um, C is a yes. That's the constant function. Y equals negative 9. So that's degree 0. You can attach x to the 0 to the end of that if you want to see it. And then all of the other answers are just negative 9. The leading term is negative 9. The leading coefficient is negative 9. The constant is negative 9. Everything is negative 9. Or whatever that C value happens to be. All right, any questions on those three? Okay, the bottom one's a special case. That's why I want to do this one together. This is a polynomial. We're not going to do a whole lot with these, but it might pop up on Math Excel just with these yes-no questions. It is a polynomial. If you have more than one variable in a term, to find the degree, you're going to take the powers on your variables and add them together. Do you guys remember doing that maybe in like Algebra 1? Does that sound familiar? No? Okay. You add them together. So we would say that first term has a degree 5. My second term has a degree 3. My third term is degree 1 because there's just one variable, x, uh, y to the first, and my last one, x to the first. Now, whichever term has the highest power, that's your leading term. So in this example, my leading term is what we see first, 9x uh, squared y to the third, which means the leading coefficient is 9, the degree is the sum of those powers, 5. And then this one, do we have a constant, a number without a variable? So constant, you would just say none. Okay, so again, we're not going to be doing a lot of like graphing or anything with this type of function, but it might pop up in the yes-no stuff. Okay. Questions there. What is a polynomial and its properties? Great. Moving on. All right, so uh, nothing here that you need to write down for now. I'll tell you in a second what I want you to write down. So next thing we're going to talk about with a polynomial is its end behavior. What's going to happen on the end of a polynomial? Now remember they're continuous, so there's going to be no breaks in the middle. We're going to focus on the far left and on the far right. Two things that can happen with a polynomial is it can go up on one side and down on, well, I take that back. It can go up or down on either side. Those are your two options. Okay, and we're going to figure out what's happening on the left and what's happening on the right. Is it going up on both sides, down on both sides, or a version of the two? Um, what you can think about when we're talking about end behavior are your even degree functions and your odd degree functions that come from our parent functions. Um, parent function of x squared looks like our parabola, our quadratics we've been talking about, goes up on both sides. Any even power, x to the fourth, x to the sixth x to the 8, so on and so forth, will also go up on both sides if we just look at its basic function. All the odd degree functions will look like our cubic function from our parent function, where they're going down on the left and up on the right. We also talked about in quadratics, if I put a negative in front of the x, it flips it upside down, right? If my parabola is going up, it's positive in front of it. Parabola going down, it's a negative coefficient. Same thing can happen with the odd degree functions. If I put a negative in front of it, it can make the ends go the opposite way. What you need to write down are these four cases. Um, these, notice there's little dashed lines in the middle. We don't actually really care about what's happening in the middle right now. We're just focusing on the far left and the far right of each of these pictures. Two things that you need to consider to find the end behavior of a polynomial. The first thing we're going to look at is our n, which is our degree. The top two cases represent an even degree function. So second power, fourth power, sixth power, whatever. Both ends will go in the same direction, like our parabolas. If you have a leading coefficient, that's that a, that's positive, both ends are going to go up. If you have a leading coefficient that is negative, both ends are going to go down. Then we have the two cases where our degree is odd. If your degree is odd 
and you have a positive leading coefficient, it's going to go like our cubic function down on the left and up on the right. If you have an odd degree with a negative leading coefficient, they're going to be the opposite. It's going to go up on the left and down on the right. So you really don't even need all those little curves in the middle. The four shapes that are really happening here are a parabola going up, you can think about, a parabola going down, a cubic function that's increasing from left to right, like x to the third, and then a cubic function that's decreasing from left to right, the opposite of our x to the third. Those are the four kind of shapes we're going to think about when we talk about end behavior of a polynomial. How we write end behavior. So you should be able to say it's going to go up on both sides or down on both sides or one of each. Once you're able to do that, there is a formal way to write that, and it looks like the following. It starts with x approaches negative infinity is how I would read this, and x approaches positive infinity. It will always have that in the notation. That means look on the left side of the graph and look on the right side of the graph. Okay, so nothing really um, specific to the function itself yet. Then your job when you're listing n behavior is to state what's happening with the y. The y values as you go forever to the left and forever to the right can again either go up or go down. So like on this first one where n is even and a is positive, we said both sides go up. So my y's would both go towards positive infinity versus on the other one, my y's would both approach negative infinity because on that one, both of my n's are going down, but the x's look the same. Negative infinity, positive infinity. Again, because that distinguishes between what's happening on the left and what's happening on the right. You can go ahead, Sabia. We can list it for the ones that are odd as well. X approaches negative infinity on the left of this one. It's going down. So Y approaches negative infinity. On the right, it's going up. So as X approaches positive infinity, Y approaches positive infinity. And then the final case, on the left, it's going up. And on the right, it's going down. So x is left, right, negative infinity, positive infinity. Y is up, down, positive infinity, negative infinity. And the shape should be enough to tell you that. All right, so make sure at minimum in your notes you have those four shapes. The conditions that will give us those four shapes, even, odd, positive, negative, and then what the end behaviors look like. All right, so here's how we use these. We're going to do a couple together, and then you can try them on your Big Idea worksheet. There is a theorem that says we can use the leading term of the polynomial to figure out the entire end behavior. Now, all the rest of the terms will help us figure out what's going to happen in the middle. For right now, we're just worried about the ends, and that's called the leading term test. So when you're doing the homework, it'll say use the leading term test to find the end behavior of the polynomial. And all you have to do is be able to find that leading term, which is the guy that has the highest power. In this case, it's negative x to the fourth. That's going to give me my end behavior. 
Two pieces of information that you want to pull from that term. Number one is your n, your power, even or odd. In this case, it is even. The other thing you want to know is, is your a, or your a sub n, that's your leading coefficient, the number in front, positive or negative? It is negative. So as soon as it says even, in your brain, you should be thinking it's going to be like a parabola on the n. Second, it's saying negative. So what happens if there's a negative in front of an x squared? It's going down. This picture should pop in your mind. I don't care if you know what case number it is. I want you to be able to, if it's even and negative, make me that picture. Okay? If you can make me that picture, you should be able to tell me that on both ends, it's going to go down. So formally writing that end behavior, it's always going to look like this to start. X approaches negative infinity, X approaches positive infinity, which just means we're about to list what's going to happen on the left and the right. Your job is to fill in the Y's. And from that picture, we know on both sides, it's going to go down. So my Y's will both approach negative infinity. On the left, it's going down is what that first end behavior tells me. And on the right, it's going down is what the second end behavior tells me. Make sense? That's all we're doing with this leading term test. We're looking at that first term, even or odd power, positive or negative coefficient, figuring out which of the four cases our ends are going to look like. All right, go to your big idea worksheet. I want you guys to try the two that are on there. Find the leading term of each polynomial and use that to list the end behavior with the infinities. I'll give you a minute. <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look at it. Do you guys see that negative 2x to the fifth is the leading term here? Because they're out of order? Got to pick the one that has the highest power. So the power is odd. And the a value, the number in front of it, is negative, which means it's going to look like a cubic shape, but it's going to be going down from left to right instead of up from left to right. So on the left, it's going up, and on the right, it's going down. That's what my end behavior tells me. On the left, it's going up. On the right, it's going down. And then for this one, 4x to the 6, which means your power is even, your degree is even, leading coefficient is positive, I mean, it's going to just look like a parabola on the ends that opens up. So on the left, it's going up, and on the right, it's going up. That's what my end behavior tells me. All right? Questions on that, getting the end behavior of a polynomial. Eventually, when you do this in calculus, they'll add the word limit in front of this. The limit as x approaches infinity and the limit as x approaches negative infinity. So this is something that definitely comes back later. Last thing we're going to do today. We know what's happening on the ends. Now we're going to figure out a little bit what's happening in the middle of this graph. And doing that is really review. Um, we're going to find the x-intercepts of the graph. And x-intercepts, review from Algebra 2, can be called various things. They can be called zeros, solutions, or roots. So if you see any of those, if you're asked to find the zero, if you're asked to find a solution, if you're asked to find a root, they all mean find the x-intercept, which we have been doing since like the second week of school. The x-intercept means plug zero in for y and then solve for x. For right now, we're just going to find real zeros. By the end of the chapter, we will also be finding imaginary zeros. Right now, only real answers are what we're concerned about. And for right now, the only way that we're going to find those is by factoring. So this is just um, a little end here today, review of factoring. First thing you look for when you are factoring any problem is, is there a GCF, a greatest common factor? So I've got my first problem here, f of x equals 2x to the third minus 16x squared plus 30x. Do I have any greatest common factors? 2x. Okay, so 0 equals 2x 
if I factor out a 2x, what am I left with? x squared minus 8x plus 15. Okay, now look in that parentheses. Does that factor any further? Two numbers that multiply to 15 and add to negative 8. What are they? Yep, negative 3, negative 5. Once it's factored completely or as much as you can, you're going to take each factor and set it equal to zero. Zero product property. We did this before with quadratics. And we solve for x. Don't forget the one that you factored out in front. That's going to give me, if I divide by 2, 0, 5, and 3. Are right, your three zeros, the x-intercepts on this graph. If you want to check it, you can plug the numbers in and see that you get 0. If you don't have a graphing calculator, or you can graph it and see if that's where it's crossing the x-axis. It's the quickest way to do it. The other way of factoring we're going to look at is what we're going to use in this next problem. The next problem, I have 2x to the third minus 3x squared plus 4x minus 6. Again, the first thing I want to check for is a GCF. Do all four of those terms have anything in common? They do not. So that's a problem because it's still a cubic. It's not a quadratic, something that I can solve with like my quadratic formula. So we're going to factor by grouping. You guys remember doing this? We reviewed it a little bit at the beginning of the year, I think in like August. We reviewed this a little bit. This is where you pair your terms up two and two. If you have four terms and they don't have anything in common, likely you are going to factor by grouping, pair them up two and two. So how we do this, we factor out what they have in common from each pair. What do the first two terms have in common? X squared, and that leaves me with 2x minus 3. What does the next pair have in common? 2. So I'm going to factor out a positive 2, and that leaves me with 2s minus 3, and that's the key to factoring by grouping. You need that same parentheses twice. So if you have like opposites, you could always factor a negative out to make that parentheses look the same. Your factors then are that parentheses you got twice, 2x minus 3, and then the two pieces that you factored out, x squared plus 2. And at this point, if you want to check it, you can just kind of mentally FOIL it back out. And your FOIL term should be the four guys that you started with at the beginning. So you can make sure it makes sense. Now, x squared plus 2, I can't really do anything with. So at this point, I'm just going to set my factors equal to 0. 2x minus 3 equals 0. x squared plus 2 equals 0. The first one, add 3, divide by 2, 3 halves is my first solution. The second one, um, I have a single x, so I can solve using square roots. Subtract 2, x squared equals negative 2. Then I can take the square root. What's going to happen if I take the square root of a negative? That's an imaginary number, right? Are we looking for imaginary zeros right now? We are only looking for real zeros. So although there will eventually be a solution that we'll care about from that, right now our answers are only the real zeros, which that's not going to be a real number. So 3 halves is the only actual x-intercept you're going to see on the graph if you check it. All right, last two problems. I'm going to make a warm-up for tomorrow. So on your big idea worksheet, We've got two factoring problems where I want you to find all the real zeros. So you guys can take like the last, I don't know, five, ten minutes, try them on your own. We'll put them on the board at the beginning of the period tomorrow, and then we'll kind of put all these different little pieces and parts together to get a graph of these as our ultimate goal by the end of the day tomorrow. Okay? So um, I'll do the cell phone lotto. Try these on your own, and then you guys can be working on your 3-1 or your 3-2 math Excel if you want.